Hello, sportsmen. October 1st, Michigan's bow opener for deer. Hey, I'm going to be out there. Hunters are going to be using all kinds of equipment, all kinds of sights, different bows. We're going to talk about bow hunting on this edition of the show. We have our recipes, updates, and a lot more. So you stay tuned. Bow hunting night here on The Practical Sportsman. A hundred years ago, this was a bow to bow hunters. This was a bow that Indians used. It's what Fred Bear started with, called a long bow, a stick and a string. Very simple. Knock the arrow, pull it back. No sights, just instinctively feel where that arrow should go and let it fly. With practice, people got good at using bows and arrows like this. But the long bow, well, it's gotten a lot more popular, I'd say, in the past three or four years in particular but there's still a lot of hunters who use high-tech equipment. Now, we have an array of bows right here. Gary Botech brought these in. Gary, we've fished for bluegill together. We've rabbit hunted together. Right. And now, tomorrow, opens the passion season. Deer hunting. For you, yes, deer hunting with a bow and arrow. I have, every hunter is, I think, most concerned of, of everything that's on a bow, not so much the stabilizer or the overdraw, things like that, but the sight. Right. It is so personal, what you use to sight with, unlike the old long bows. Now, this, what kind of bow is this? That's a PSE. And what kind of sight is this? Well, it's a Mongoose 106, but I altered it and put my own pin in it, a lighted sight pin. I like those the best. Okay, well, this sight pin is away from the riser on the bow. It's, it's out a little farther, which makes it theoretically a little more accurate. You line up once you get the, your anchor point, and I'm using a kisser button. Can you see that, John? Right? Right there. That's the kisser button because you put it generally in the corner of your mouth. And then once you've got that lined up, you just put that sight pin right on the target and let it fly. This is one of the simpler bows you have. The cams are, well, these are fairly round. Right. These wheels mm -hmm. on this. Okay, let's move down to this one. That's what kind of bow is this? Browning uh, Ballistic Mirage. Okay, with... What kind of sight system? Well, it's basically this uh, decathlon made by Cobra, and um, I just put the same lighted sight pin. It's called a right light sight pin, and it you turn it on, it adjusts. Oh, look at that! Dim to bright. Dim to bright. Now this is not illegal for bow hunting in Michigan, because no. you're not using it to locate the game. You're just using it to see your sight pin. Now there's another light you have up here. That's just well, a lot of people use those lights to light up their sight pins. It works good for me. I put it on there when I let my bow out of the tree when it's dark. Huh. Um, you can, it kind of shines the ground up You see where it's going. So again, the, the kisser button, there's a stay put arrow rest on there. Look at that. This is why we call it high tech, but we aren't even started yet. What kind of bow is this? That's a high country ultra extreme, and it's got a hydraulic uh, stabilizer. stabilizer on it. So there's hydraulic fluid in here? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, the function of a stabilizer is not so much, as I understand it, when you're holding the bow to minimize the jiggle, but when you release the arrow. Right. So it, it takes a lot it, of the vibration away. Holds the bow steady. Now look at this one. Of course, we can probably crank on the sight pin here. Same kind as the other one. I, like I said, I find those to work the best for me. Now, do you, do you see that right in the front there, John? See that, that bubble? It looks like I'm a carpenter here, <laughs> you know, measuring something up. But that bubble lets you know if you're holding the bow to one side or to the other, which Theoretically, if it's, if it's too far off, it can affect the arrow flight, so you try to center the bubble there. A lot of things to do. Center the sight, center the bubble. It's kind of hard to do that, though. I just thought I'd try it out. Now, here's a sight. Look at this thing. That, that goes on the bow, and you would select which crosshair you want by the distance. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at that. These are plastic? Uh, yeah, right. Huh. And they, they uh, kind of gather the light, so they yeah, that's... stick out a little bit in the uh, evening time. All kinds of sights, all kinds of sights here. There's people at home saying, ooh, got to have one of those. Here's a different sight. I don't know about this one. Well, we, that's Dave's bow, my hunting partner. And we got the bracket here at the um, clinic at Anderson Archery in Grand Lodge. Oh, I see. So this bracket is just a one-piece bracket. Right, uh-huh. This is more like a... A rifle in that it has a, a rear sight with little crosshairs there. And it's also got a light right here when you turn this on. That'll light that up like that. I don't know if you can see that, John. Little red light right there. And then this other end, I'll flip it around here real quick. 
There's the other end of the sight. Another lighted sight pin. That one's mm -hmm. hard to shoot. You've got to line the, the dot up with the crosshairs, hmm. and uh, Dave likes those kinds. He so. likes it. Yeah. <laughs> Personal preference. I'll tell you, that is something else. This one here, I was monkeying around with this a little bit earlier. I'll tell you, this one, they ought to put back on the market. You say you haven't been able to find one. Not at all. I wish we could because those things, I, I know they would place. sell. Look at the distance here between the rear sight and the front sight. Quite a distance, which should enhance the accuracy. It's almost like a peep sight here at the rear, except it's not on the string. And you line it up out there. Ooh, I think I like this one. It's just like a, a rifle. and. Look at that it, baby wheel. It works I'm good. pretty steady. And that's a Mepro oh. light at the end, which uh, lights up when it gets darker. I like that. It's I a nice like setup. That. All kinds of sights you can use. In fact, there are more than this. There's peep sights on the string. Tons. All kinds of things. We're going to talk more about this in the future, but you can see it's uh, come a long ways from the long bow. There's, there's, there's quite a bit of difference when you look at them. There sure is. Look at this cam on the end right here. In fact, pull that back, Gary. And let, let's just watch Oops. that cam turn over like that. And when you let it go, it snaps. Yep. A long ways from the old stick and a string, but uh, this bow season, a lot of deer will be taken with long bows, a lot with compounds. No doubt. And I think we're going to be in that category, aren't we? I'm sure somebody's going to get a deer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, with all this equipment, we ought to. You can't miss. Well, at first glance, compound bows all look sort of the same with the wheels, pulleys, cams, and cables. But there are subtle differences from bow to bow. This bow is made by Archery Dynamics in Swartz Creek. It's called a bullet. This is the bow I'm going to use this season. And I actually put this bow together myself. Let's go up to Swartz Creek and see what this bow is all about. The uh, things that contribute to speed are the cam design, and the distance that the, or the length of time. Mathematics and physics, that's what modern compound bows are all about. Jim Linden is the marketing manager for Archery Dynamics in Swartz Creek. When we started, we took uh, the, the thought that the best way to project an arrow or anything is to try to put all the forces equally behind it, mm -hmm. whether it be from top and bottom or from the side. Well, isn't that in, in any bow? You pull it back, don't you have the forces right behind it? Pushing well, you it? do, but not equally balanced. It, it, they attempt, or most attempt, to get equal balance, but what we've done is we've got the arrow release point at the dead center between the top and bottom axles. So now, that, hold up, hold it though. A lot of people out there are going to say, what's so amazing about that? Isn't that where all bows draw? Uh, in no, the middle of the string? Actually not. They don't? No. I think if most people would check, most of the time their arrow is slightly about uh, anywhere from one inch to two inches above the center of the bow string? Of the, of the, of the uh, distance between the axles. I'll be darned. So all, most bows draw off center. Slightly off center, that's correct. But this Usually one, above center. This one is designed with the handle a little lower. Correct. This new bow is called a bullet. It's the product of the computer age in archery. Production is limited on these bows because of the way they're built. They're machined individually, one at a time. Computer models are used for every aspect of the design, stress tests and prescribing tool paths for automated lathes. It's all worked out in advance, then the machines carve out the parts with absolute precision. This machine is making the cuts on the riser, which is the middle part of the bow, to which the limbs are attached. Now, compound bows aren't all one piece, they're a compilation of parts. High-grade aircraft aluminum is used for the riser, but since most of these bows are used by deer hunters, the parts are sent out for camouflage paint jobs. You know, the camo pattern has gotten to be more than just functional. It's gotten to be stylish. With precision parts machined to tolerances of thousandths of an inch, the parts are interchangeable within models. Bob Bennett is the guy who puts most of these bows together, and he talked me through the steps of building this one. The first step, uh, that's attaching the two limbs to the riser. They're held by machined pegs and a bolt. Now, tightening that bolt can change the draw weight to some degree, but I'm making this bow for 60 pounds. That's sufficient for deer hunting and not too hard to pull back. A bow press bends the limbs so I can put on the cams, cables, and string. The difference between a compound bow and a traditional long bow or recurve is right here. The wheels or cams which act as pulleys for the cable and string. Now, traditional bows 
use the limbs to stack up energy. Compounds use limbs plus pulleys to get an extra mechanical advantage. After the cables are attached to the cams, there are two separate cables that run from wheel to wheel, plus a bowstring, which is what the archer pulls to launch the arrow. Now the cables run between the cams and are held slightly off center by a cable guide bar so they won't interfere with the shot. Now the last step in assembling the basic bow is putting on the string. There are several options on the cams for different string lengths. And of course, the string length depends on the length of the archer's arms. Now to string or unstring a compound bow, you need a bow press. Now this is kind of a disadvantage because usually you'll only find bow presses in archery shops. But the advantages of a compound bow in arrow speed, accuracy, and ease of shooting have made compound bows extremely popular among hunters. This is how a compound bow, the bullet, goes together. Now I had to probably inspect this to make sure everything looks fine to you. The magic thing about a compound bow is the let off. It'll take about 60 pounds of effort to pull this bow back, but once the cams roll over, it'll only require about 30% of that strength to hold the bow at full draw. Now we're going to check the draw weight and just simply place it at the midpoint right on the, what we call the burger okay. button and pull straight down with both hands. Spread your hands out a little bit further apart. Hands further up. There you go. Now pull down. There. Now you can we'll see watch that. the gauge up here. It is at 60, 60 pounds. It broke over. And what are you holding now? What am I holding? Yeah, Not you feel much. it? All right, now you look. Okay. You're holding about 15 to 18 pounds after it breaks over. So that's how you that check the draw is, weight. That's weird. And the rest of those pounds are in these cams. <laughs> that's right. I, in the cams and the limbs. Well, I don't totally understand the physics here, but I do know that with an overdraw and some other doodads, I'll have an ultimate high-tech bow that isn't actually a work of art. It's a precision product of modern computerized engineering. And here's the bullet outfitted. Gary Botek put a sight on it. In fact, one of these lighted sight pens. Uh, instead of one of the other sights, which has a kisser button, uh, and you just look at the sight, this bow has what's called a peep sight. See this little thing on the string? This is not a kisser button. As I pull this back, it cants up at an angle, and it opens up so I can see through the hole in that piece of plastic. I line that up with the sight pin through that little teeny hole, and it makes a peep sight. That means the bow string and the sight and the target are all in perfect line. This, I think, is probably one of the most accurate ways to sight a compound bow. So I'm going to start off this season with this type of sight. Now, I use, instead of my fingers, which I've used for years, and by the way, I still enjoy traditional archery. I love shooting with the fingers, but I'm trying this out because it's just something a little bit different, and it's highly accurate, too. But this is called a release, a release aid, which you clip on the string like that and pull it back. It pulls the string back, and when I want to release it, I touch this trigger like that. Can't dry snap one of these bows, but by pulling the trigger, release the arrow smoothly. This should be the most accurate setup that I could use for high-tech archery. Uh, oh, one thing, this quiver on here, this is very slick. Archery Dynamics makes this. Twist it and pull it down, and it comes right off. So there's all kinds of new designs that different companies have for quivers, arrows, releases, we'll be getting into these things in the future. But whatever you have, just make sure you get out and use it because you have a good chance at getting a deer if you're a good hunter and you know your equipment. There was a good uh, lesson on this, uh, getting this buck. Uh, you, you hear a lot of stories about going to your blind very carefully so you don't spook anything and it was particularly quiet the afternoon I went out. So I was very, very quiet getting into my blind, and after I was in it about a half an hour, I heard something behind me and turned around, and two bu this buck was with another buck, and they were only about 55 yards away, and they just stood up from their beds. Oh. And uh, I had passed within 40 yards of them when I came out, and they didn't, you know, because I was quiet, I guess they didn't hear me. And they, be done. So then they came by yeah, your stand? 17-yard shot. Bob Gibson from Climax took this 13-point in Kalamazoo County on the second day of firearm season, but the principle of quietly going to your stand goes for gun hunters or bow hunters. And so does the principle of using a grunt call. David Overholt from Grand Rapids found it works. This buck, you said 
in your story that you sent, and this is a this is a ten point with a twenty two inch spread that you you were in your blind and you made a, a grunt in your grunt call. Yes, uh, I grunted and he answered back about ten feet away from me. How'd that feel? Oh. Well, I changed my underwear and then shot him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just about the long and short of it there. Yeah. But you got the biggest out of a group of deer. This is an awesome rack. We probably look pretty cool standing by. Yeah, this I think so. Relatively few hunters will get bucks that qualify for the trophy book, but, you know, you don't have to bag a trophy to have a good hunt. Oh, it is a nice touch, though. We have a, well, it's a, a board full of, what do you call these? Dwayne? These are called pizza bites. <clears throat> pizza bites, venison mm -hmm. pizza bites. Mm -hmm. But you made each of these with a different type, not each, but each roll. Mm -hmm. And this is? This has pizza sauce on it. Pizza sauce. I'll give one here to Marge Farragon, who's, who's our big helper <laughs> here in the mm -hmm. Practical Sportsman. And that one has taco seasoning in it. Taco seasoning. And that has just plain tomato paste in there with a tomato little bit paste. of Italian seasoning in it. Marge, would you mind just taking like a bite of each of those? First of all, to see if you can tell the difference. We're gonna talk about while well, Wayne and I here, this is Wayne Rausch from Napoleon, Ohio, who has mm -hmm. scrumptious, scrumptious recipes. Of course, you, you're the cook at your deer camp, right? We don't have a deer camp per se. It's a Frank's house, yeah. I do a lot of cooking, ribs and stuff. I use a lot of recipes in your recipe book. Well, and now a lot of people are gonna be using mm -hmm. yours. Because you have several of them here this year, but this is this is the what pizza sauce pizza sauce that goes on <clears throat> on mm -hmm. the one and tomato paste on the other and basically you use these little country biscuit rolls yeah, biscuit rolls you put those in a muffin tin mm -hmm. and then you take your brown venison and you add your seasonings or you know your sauces and mix mm -hmm. it together put it on top of the biscuit dough and cheese on top of that and away you go well you can taste that they're venison mm -hmm. a little bit oh, just okay. a hint. I love the mozzarella cheese on top. Mm -hmm. And Mar mm, Marge tackle. here makes the best peach pies. Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to bum another one right now, <laughs> if she'll make me another one. You make the best pies and the best crusts. So what do you think about using something like this? It's fine. It's OK? It works real good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they make really good little tart things. Mm -hmm. They're really good. You have um, how Kids many? Kids would love them, 13. <laughs> you know what you know I was going to say? How many grandkids do you have? <laughs> 13. Well, you gotta you gotta set up for them now. Yeah, it doesn't take long to do them either. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's quick and it's it's handy for like a party. You can make up a couple dozen mm -hmm. of these and set them out on the table and, and you know, the kids get on their cells. Mm -hmm. I gotta congratulate Wayne once again. Super. So you would you would recommend this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the kids could do them themselves. Oh, that's right. Yes, they could. Make a little project there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good practical idea. You want a copy of that recipe? Hey, it's in the August-September issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine. The cover is an original pheasant painting by Lansing artist Tom Phillips. A week ago, news broke of a federal indictment against Tempotech, a company based in Hart along Lake Michigan that processes salmon and salmon eggs. Now, this indictment involves 27 counts, ranging from income tax evasion to bribery to selling tainted salmon eggs for human consumption. Now, these charges were brought in the state of New York. But because Tempotech has the exclusive contract for harvesting salmon and salmon eggs for Michigan's DNR, an investigation has been rekindled that apparently involves DNR employees and a former state legislator. Now, this investigation was squashed in 1983 before criminal charges were brought. It said that the termination was a political cover-up. Well, here are some facts regarding the Michigan contract, according to the Muskegon Chronicle. Now, since 1983, Tempo Tech has paid the DNR nearly $130,000 for 13.8 million pounds of salmon and salmon eggs. That works out to less than one cent a pound. The resale price, $3 to $5 a pound. Last year, Tempo Tech only paid the DNR $1,035 for salmon. Tempo Tech's 1986 contract, which was a 10-year contract, prohibits access to its financial records, so what they make, what they spend, who they pay can't be traced. Well, will this 1993 DNR investigation be squashed like it was in 1983? Oh, let's hope not. A lot of us are skeptical about DNR operations, and the sportsmen of Michigan deserve to know the truth about the DNR and how they spend sportsmen's money. That's my opinion. Um, 
She's going to make it look really When I talk about Sporting Dog Weekend at the Practical Sportsman Center and Museum, I'm talking about an event that will develop in a few months into demonstrations of dog training, exhibitors of dog products, along with people who have sporting dog puppies for sale. New puppies become available every month. We had a number of breeds at our first Sporting Dog Weekend in September. Now, these are Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. Well, we also had Brittany's, Labradors of various colors, Springer Spaniels, English Setters, Hungarian Vizlas, Beagles, and German Short Hair and German Wire Haired Pointers. Jeremy and Sporting Dog Puppies, something for people to do who aren't hunting, fishing, or at a football game. I tell you, there's lots to do, almost too much to do in the months ahead with all of our hunting seasons and activities, but what the heck. It's nice to have things to choose from, nice to be here in Michigan with <laughs> weather that, that I hope is going to be good, and I hope you can get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on The Practical Sportsman, we'll get into bow camp with tips and ideas on tenting, outdoor facilities. We'll talk about how deer behavior changes from early October to late October. Oh, we'll have a mouth-watering recipe, trophy book stories, and more. So tune in next week, same time, same station, right here for another brand new edition of The Practical Sportsman.